Hey guys, thanks again for tuning in. Now before you freak out, I know the video is long, but keep in mind in the descriptions and even in the comments down below, I left it to where like, you can go directly to the section and, and and question that you want to answer. So you don't have to watch the entire video if you don't want to. If you do, that'd be great. I know it's pretty long, so you don't have to. That's why I divided it up to sections. So feel free to go down to the comments or the description to go to the sections that you want and the questions that you want answered. Again, thank you for tuning in. Let's roll the video. What's up guys? Thanks for tuning in to another video. In this episode, we're going to dive deeper into the questions that y'all asked us, primarily asking advice for the PMs and for the tech lead. And today we actually have a few of the members that I work with and also students that are taking the class next semester just to make sure that all the questions that you guys have gets answered. If by any chance there's a question we don't get uh, clarified here, please leave them down in the description below, or I mean in the comments below, and we'll be sure to answer them as quick as possible. But like I said, my name is Juan Rivas. Thank you so much again for tuning in. I'm going to pass it for the team so they can introduce themselves. Uh, hi, I'm Eric Whiting. I was the development leader. Hi, uh, I'm Robert. I'm an upcoming student for the course. You have a lot of questions, man. I got questions. <laughs> the answers. Hi, my name is Christopher Reese. Uh, I served as the project manager for this prior capstone class. All right, guys. Well, we're gonna start it off. Uh, first off, we're gonna start off with the tech questions. So this is just gonna be spinning around. So whatever uh, you know, we we come up with, it's gonna go. Uh, so, anyways. Start off with tech lead. Any like, top level problem? What do you think like students need to know like before starting this class? For at least from the tech side, like any uh, computer, uh, I mean, any like frameworks or anything like that that you recommend, or anything to know ahead of time as general as possible. Well, so I asked that question the first day, um, and he said his point was, "Well, does your team know this? Does your team know this?" So. When we went through the program, they were teaching Ruby on Rails, and so that's what everybody was expected to know. They also right, taught right. Java, but nobody, I mean, Java, you can't, it, it was a long. summer class, you know, we yeah. had, so whatever, whatever, at the time that you take this class, whatever they're teaching, um, I guess use that. Uh, we used Rails because that's what we learned, and maybe in a couple of years, if you're still watching this video, right. they're teaching something else. Use what everybody knows. And um, I actually and might want to add to that is that uh, in this class, it's not necessarily what you want to like challenge yourself in or what language you want to learn. It's more so like whatever can actually get the solution. And depending on your client, if the class is still taken the same way, depending on what your client has and uses is what you'll build towards. So it's not necessarily like what you want to use, it's depending on what's the best solution for the team and for the client. So that's something to keep in mind. It's not just whatever it is that you want. So in our case, we didn't even use Java just because it's too, it's too much of a pain to yeah. do and develop for a client. A client did not want a, 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 a desktop application, they want a web hosted application. So that's why we went with Ruby on Rails. And the requirement for the class is actually a web application. So if you were oh. to use Java, you'd have to use what, Spring or Some, something? Something in conjunction with it. Yeah. Right, and so. there, there's, no, there's no place in the rubric for uh, Professor Dettelier or Professor Gibbs to award you points for being brave and learning a new language. Right. They're, they're, it's not part of the overall grade, so. And the source code is not graded. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. It's turned in, that he wants you to print it out, but it's not graded. It's, it's a technicality of yeah. and, and keep in mind also that, even though right now people are gonna be taking it with Atelier or uh, Sadevi is it, or whatever Gibbs. it is. Gibbs. Yeah. This is for years to come, so students might not even have to like turn in that. But for the sake yeah. of this, this upcoming, well, next upcoming years, that probably will stick around. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I do want to mention, you primarily, because you're the one who had the experience and actually just took it upon yourself to do it, is the uh, version control. Something that I personally am glad I didn't have to mess with at all, because something mm -hmm. that kind of goes over my head, but I know it's absolutely necessary for the class. Mm -hmm. Wh what do you recommend for, for version control? I know you had a certain structure for us. Right, so version control is about, is pretty much the same. As long as you're using Git, don't use, don't get fancy and use, use Mercurial or SVN. Just use Git. Um, use GitLab or Bitbucket or GitHub, whatever. Just use Git, and the basic uh, workflow that we did was there was one master branch, and that was the that was the blessed app, right? That was what worked. So anytime that anybody, whether you're the dev lead or the or the assistant developer, whatever, what you do is you is you pull the main branch, and then you branch that, make your own branch. Do your changes, test it of course on your own environment, and then push it to the to the main branch. And whoever the lead dev is should turn off everybody else's ability to merge 
So what happens is the, the dev lead will see that you submitted a merge request, or if you use GitHub, it's called a pull request. Right, right. And um, so they'll look oh. over the changes and they'll say, okay, this, this is fine, and they'll merge it into the main branch, and then your changes, again, are blessed and they're part of the main branch. So always branch off, never develop directly onto the main branch. I didn't know it called differently, merge and then uh, pull. Yeah, GitLab calls it a merge request, GitHub calls it a pull request. Yeah, I think pull, pull request. Yeah, I think pull is and, a little kind of too much in my opinion. I know it, it kind of is. Uh, and, a, and a push request, right? Mm -hmm. You're pushing. Yeah, right? push, fetch. Uh, fe well, I don't know about fetch if it applies. So I know I've used fetch before. Yeah, but. fetch is in there. So there yeah, um, but just overall, there should be one central point right. of control. It should be your dev lead. Right. Um, yes, for sure. There should be yeah. one person. And, and that was merging. crucial for us. That was that was definitely like very essential. On top of like using it with Slack in our in our case. For the version control pers uh, perspective, like how he had, had it set up, was like only he authorizes the last like push so that everyone is updated with the same code. And normally in this class is only like eight people at most, so you really there's a lot of people moving uh, moving pieces. So you want to make sure that the updated project is what everyone has and has access to. You don't want to merge just twenty of this. So it's very good that from the day one, Eric just took it upon himself to set it up that way. And I recommend that for everyone too. So I think that's a great way to start off in the version control. Uh, one thing that everyone kept asking for some reason us and right now a lot of people are a lot more students in the CIS degree are getting familiar with is the AWS setup. Okay. How the other team used DigitalOcean, which is great. We haven't used it, uh, me personally, and I don't think any of us have, but they used Digi uh, DigitalOcean. But we use AWS, and now the key here is that AWS is actually being taught at U of H as a technical elective. So a lot of you might actually be taking AWS as an elective, and you might actually might have some experience on it. I personally, thankfully, did not have to touch it. Eric, again, took it upon himself to set it up for us. How would you rate, like, how easy it was? Or, like, if beneficial? Or what, did you just choose it just for the hell of it? Or Right, so one thing I do want to make sure is clear is that when we took the class, the code and everything is supposed to be on the school server. So oh, you're not yeah. turning it in on AWS. No. And there's no requirement for it to be on AWS. Um, so what I used AWS for was kind of a central point for everybody on the team to look at as well as the client because one, I, I hope I don't offend anybody, but I didn't want anybody else on the team in the school server where we were turning things in. So if they wanted to look at it, I had an AWS server that if they broke something, it doesn't matter. So, I, so that's what I used AWS for and as far as the setup goes, it is, um, there is a small learning curve for what if you use it the way that I did, and what I did was I set up Windows Server, uh, which is what we used on the school server, and um, and I just I put the code there every now and then so that I could show everybody on the team and so that I could show the client or anybody that was, you know, not in the school server and not on my local machine. So I would just show it on AWS. Um, like I said, the learning curve there's a little bit of it because you have to set up a SSH uh, private keys. I think we've done that before for the yeah, uh, for Java. And, I think we've had to do that yes. before. Yes, <laughs> and um, and but other than that, it was it was not so hard, but it's also not required. So one thing is that uh, obviously when it comes to these hosting sites, is that not all of them are free. Correct. Yeah. So so for mine for Windows Server, as soon as everybody looked at it as many times as they wanted, I would turn it off. So and in AWS, oh, yeah, yeah, just that. be aware that. Every time you turn the server off and you turn it back on, the URL is going to change. So just keep that in mind. Um, <coughs> bless you. The cat's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, that's 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 all. If you if you're using AWS, you can use a free tier server. Uh, it'll come with one whopping gigabyte of RAM. And um, and, and what was the cost? Like, cause I don't think I ever knew what was the actual cost. Okay, so in dollars. I, so I got an eight gig server because I did not want to deal with how slow everything was on the on the free tier one. Okay. And that. Oh, that's why. Yeah, and that one month that I forgot to turn it off, I ended up racking up about two hundred dollars. You're lying. So, no, it's all right. Though. Did you? You didn't mention it at all. Uh, yeah, he didn't, didn't tell us do. this at all. <laughs> Yeah, but if you, get, if you get the free tier and you just leave it alone, it's fine. Jesus. But um, but I got I got it, like I said an eight gig server because when you when you SSH into the server and you're using Chrome, you're using I used Ruby Mine. It's like it's going slow, and I was right, like, right. man, screw this. Like, give me give me some more Good gig. quality, right? Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know they racked up to hundred man. Well, that's because I forgot to turn it off for a month. You want more beer, man? <laughs> <laughs> Please on the house for sure. 
Um, yeah, that's good. That's good from the, from the AWS side. Um, also, I don't know if I mentioned it before in another video or this one, but he actually developed a, or made a video on actually the demo of our application. If you'd like to check it out, I'll actually put it up in the YouTube card or in the description below. It's Eric Whitey, right? Uh, yes. On the, on the YouTube name? Oh, no, that's like Eric 0606 or something like that. <laughs> okay. <I'm> Some, <laughs> something something <laughs> Like your MySpace yeah. or something? <laughs> right. Yeah. MySpace? Yeah. Okay, well, you can add him on MySpace as well with that nickname. But anyways, I'll link it in the description below so you can take a look at it um, as well. Um, besides that, do you have any questions for the for the tech side? Like, I don't know if this... Not something... really, that's not my... Bro, right, right, because you're more looking project. for the PM yeah. side, right? Uh, one interesting thing that I did pick up was you stated that your client looked at the code? Or no, 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 no. no. To? no, the app. The application. Yeah, so okay. the app was Maybe running on a server so, so our client could click a link and go look at the app, not the code. Okay, and how involved was your client during the development in terms of, they would look at it and say, well, I don't like this, so, change it. <laughs> okay, so, so, yeah. so our, <laughs> our situation was a little unique in that um, for 3343, which is the first of the two database classes, we actually designed a similar application, so, um, but, because of some people not passing that class and all of that, <laughs> our team got broken up, so that never got developed and it got put to bed for about a year. Yeah. And um, so the client already kind of had, we already kind of had some understanding of what they wanted. There's some things changed. To be honest, our client kind of stopped talking to us for, But and, and go ahead. Uh, let, me, let me pause, because I, I think we, we don't want to lead people down the wrong path. Um, the fact that this had been part of a prior project uh, in a in a pro in a prior class, we had to run that fact by Professor Yeah, Jimmy. yeah, yeah. Right, 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 And right, I yeah. think it's more often than not. You asked it primarily the first yeah, week. I, 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 I was very specific, but I really think the chances of him saying yes to that are slim. The only reason we got through is because I was able to convince him that none of us hardly right. had worked on that project. But by by nature, especially outside of the summer, he's probably a little bit more lenient during right. the summer. With okay, yes, if you if this is a good project, run with it. If it's like fall or spring, he probably expects you to do a little bit more ground pounding right, to right. find a good client. And if you tell him that this client's already been engaged, has already been part of a prior project, I I suspect that might be problematic. So I wouldn't necessarily take this anecdotal experience. Yeah, I'm not yeah. saying I'm not saying talk to your client a year before you take this class. Um, <laughs> or, or think that you can use an yeah, old project. That's no, right, probably right. not my, the case. My, my point, I'm sorry, is my point is that um, our client did not, um, our client kind of went dark for mm -hmm. a, more than half of the course. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. more than that. Um, what, what, but what kind of things did we do while they were not responding? So, so what happened was we did really good analysis at first when we did have them and we had pretty clear pictures of what they wanted right. and if and if they do go dark what's going to happen is the professor is going to act as your client and yeah. he will um you kind of don't want that because he he knows what you can do and he's going to ask for a lot more than probably a non-tech savvy client would um so he will endeavor to be a, a difficult client yeah he'll it, he'll change his mind about right, the requirement right. he'll yeah, don't play the role for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, just to give you the experience of a difficult client, mm -hmm. he he will take that upon himself if you uh, enable him. So right. try to keep your client engaged if you can. Yeah. As, as yeah, best that's, as that's, you can. Oh, that's another thing actually. He actually butchered us a couple of times. Well, he didn't know at the time, but that we didn't get approval from the client on every phase that we finished. For example, like we finished a couple of modules from the app side. And we never actually got approval from the client, and that's until he caught us and like butchered us for it. And then that's when we try to contact the client, and we realize they're not actually responding. So at that point, yeah. uh, we realize that in hindsight, we should have like kept communication up and going and live almost every week. So if, sure. if you can keep as much communication with the client as possible, at least let them know like, hey, we finished this part. Do you like it? Do you not? Is this what one you're looking into? And have that in, a, in some way, shape, or form documented. Whether it was an email, whether it was a text, or whatever. Yeah. Show that in a, when the professor asks you. Because you you're gonna have to show it, prove it. Email should be documented. <clears throat> we right. had some ex we had some extraneous circumstances. There was a round of layoffs at our clients. But but we as a retrospective, we could have done more to at least attempted to get like hard physical evidence of their approval during the analysis phase that yeah. might have been useful so if we're talking in a retrospective manner while their situation wasn't the perfect one we could have done some things better those things include constant 
reportable, provable, tangible client buy-in. For sure. No. Right. Uh, one, one other thing. Yeah. So, uh, position of tech lead, lead developer, what was y'all's actual layout? So you had lead developer and were you separated by uh, UI and then a back-end application developer <clears throat> or what? Okay, so so the way it worked out is as far as technical positions, we had three. We had the technical coordinator who was supposed to be in charge of the server, getting the school server working. We had, myself was the, I was the back-end developer, but I was also the lead developer. And then we had a, uh, what did we call him? Front-end developer, basically? Front-end Front developer, right. so, design manager. So the way it worked for us, and I think it worked really well, is um, is we had our front-end developer, he's not here, unfortunately, but, um, I mean, he's still alive, I'm not saying <laughs> he's not <laughs> he with us bad. anymore. Yeah. Yeah. No, really, 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 really Robert. brilliant, great artist. He was really good. <laughs> not you, man. Not, no, the Robert. Sorry. He was he was really good at CSS um, and and design in general. Yeah. So and the and the way Rails worked, which we used Ruby on Rails, is um, you make you make the design and it kind of applies across all the views. Yeah. And um, and his his design was really good. So anytime I would make a new page or a new anything like that, his design was already there. And so yeah. I'm sorry to answer your question. We had a front end developer, a back end developer, and a tech coordinator. And as I was the back end developer, and as the as the lead developer, I kind of I kind of decided how the application would work architecturally. Um, and but I also did most of the coding, so right, right, so yeah. I did so. And correct me if I'm wrong. I think as an advice for anyone taking the course, I think if you were to split it, I think I would put two backend developers to help you out because I know you were a beast and you did it all by yourself. But I think you could have done a lot, not a lot more, but a lot less stressful. I know you love to code, but not everyone. Actually, 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 I would say first of all, I think your your backend guy and your lead developer, whatever, they should also be the tech lead. I wanted to say that before. I was about to say, what is the the tech coordinator seems sort of so nebulous. Tech, we, yeah, we, yeah, we yeah. probably need to explain exactly what the okay. tech because it's a very specific thing. The tech yeah. Coordinator is so the of. tech coordinator is a required position from the professor, mm -hmm. yeah. and it's the person that talks to the actual uh, sys admin for the school. Yeah. And the tech coordinator is the person that's supposed to be interfacing with that guy. Um, okay. I think you should make the main developer also the tech coordinator right, because right, the, right. the main developer is going to decide what versions you're using, yeah. what how, how the application is going to be pretty much set up. So you want that to be the same person. But There's also an encouraged secondary role for the technical coordinator, uh, which is interfacing with that other team. And their tech coordinator right, right. specifically, that, yeah, but yeah. the other team's that's dev true. team at large. Uh, so it, it, there is definitely, uh, and it's it, you know, of course, plagiarism cheating is obviously out from the, from from go. But Professor Detillier did encourage a certain degree of crosstalk, especially when it came to uh, technical issues, especially when those technical issues were concerned with the school server. Right. right. So that tech coordinator was was supposed to be traversing those problems, utilizing both the university administrator, sysadmin, and the other teams. Uh, development efforts and, and technical coordinator. Um, so yeah, and, and I agree wholeheartedly that 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 position is it's a technical strategic decision mm -hmm. position because they're making those leadership or strategic planning decisions, and they also need to be capable of communication. You had five people. We had six, six yeah, people. We six, yeah, yeah. yeah, which was one more than usual uh, for, the for our summer for course. The summer. Right, right. Yeah. Let me answer your question about the two back-end developers. I think it's better to have one back-end developer and then two people that are good at GUI and probably good at JavaScript. So um, unfortunately, Juan's really good at JavaScript, but he, we, didn't, we weren't able to utilize that a lot. And um, so a lot of our forms and a lot of the, it, there wasn't a lot of interaction as I'd like there to be, and I'm not great with JavaScript. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> I, w I wish that uh, we could have utilized him more on that. But so we had one CSS guy who made the site beautiful, and then one back end guy who made everything work perfectly. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it would have been it would have been great to kind of have a middle person too. So I wouldn't recommend two back end developers. I would recommend one logic developer, and then maybe two guys splitting the the. The design and the control flow. So, well, the the tech lead and Sarah. So, you have a, a tech lead that makes the executive decisions on uh, 
this is how the application is going to work to, and that we found out from the business analysis. Mm -hmm. This is what we need to fulfill. This is how the application is going to do it. And they lead the coding, but the backend developer would do the bulk of the coding itself as well as the UI and the tech lead would make sure um, that it aligns with the overall objectives. Does that? In my opinion, the tech lead and the backend developer should be the same person. Should be the same, not a dual backend no. developer. Well, and you don't have enough people for that many. Sure. Yeah, and, and the bulk of the work is backend. And, and as a result, that, that's, that really sets the pace for the development and technical efforts overall. And so that's just as good a point as any to have the gatekeeper for coordination. Um, that communication that helps inform some of the more technical details, school server and other uh, details. The back-end developments where most of the hours are going to be booked, and we'll talk about booking hours a little bit later. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's actually that's a very what, that's, yeah. that's what most questions came about, actually, <coughs> yeah. just that part in yeah. particular. But I, I, I agree from the standpoint of that's where the rubber meets the road. The, the CSS can be good or bad, and you don't, you don't stop progress. Mm -hmm. You fix it later, but it, it doesn't pace you. The, the Java functionality, nice little tidbits and, and control uh, functionality, that can be good or bad, but it doesn't stop. Backend development is how far along your application is. By virtue of that, it, the, the technical coordinator really should be right there. That's a good point, yeah. yeah. And one thing actually, uh, and this kind of steering around from the tech side is that the first thing I think you guys, I, mean, I worked on it as well, but that we did from the technical team is develop the ERD in the data dictionary. That is, I mean, my opinion, that's just me because from the organization standpoint, it's pivotal for determining what are the next steps to do. Yeah. For example, on the dev side, if you develop our ERD in an agile manner, like you're developing as you're developing code, you're going to have a lot of discrepancies later on. And the way Ruby on Rails works, I mean, you coded more but, than I did, of course, uh, but it's kind of hard to rearrange the models or the, that's actually general, but like how to rearrange a database structure. I think it's a lot easier if you just develop your ERD and your data dictionary, set it in stone and just develop on there. And, and Eric, what, what's something that we messed up when it came oh, to the goodness. ERD? Okay, so you, about, you on that? about maybe two weeks before the yeah. project was due, uh, and, and he brought this up. This is not to throw the professor under the bus or anything, but um, we, yeah. we realized, at, we'll say realized, two weeks before the project was due uh, that the ERD was missing a major component. And basically what it was was a table, and then every other table had to reference that table. Yeah. And so I was able to do it. I was able to implement the change. I was... Only in the database, though I couldn't, I couldn't yeah. do it in the application. I uh, it's it's in the database. It's ready for usage. But um, so during our presentation, we were able to say, in complete honesty, uh, we have coded this functionality, uh, which is location. So we were building an app for a gym. <clears throat> what the requirement we realized too late was that we need to code our application to be able to encompass multiple gyms, which right. is a, of the same. Company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so what we were able to do during our presentation is say, here's a potential upgrade for our application. Uh, we have done, say, half the work. We right. coded the database is waiting for this upgrade. It's just the front end web app that needs this work. And I think we, we got away with it. I mean, we, yeah. And to be fair, during our analysis, um, that was not identified as a uh, as a requirement. Uh, yeah. Kevin's here. Yeah. I, I can talk. Yeah, hey. I'm gonna take a quick break. Just a little bio break. I'll be right back. Hi, well, my name is Kevin Blanco. I was also a project manager for this capstone over the summer. Uh, I was counterpart uh, equivalent of Chris Reese, which you've probably already heard about. Uh, I led the second group in the class. It was quite an experience over the summer. It was something uh, to remember. It's definitely challenging, uh, but something rewarding uh, that you feel at the very end once you're completed. Uh, so I hope you enjoy the video. hope you enjoy uh, and find useful the, uh, what we speak about in the video. Uh, and hopefully it's of good use to you. And I phoned my intro in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're sitting here sipping on whiskey like, hi, I'm Chris. <laughs> I have some PM stuff. Technical coordinator back in. Yeah, but, yeah, but not so much the technical coordinator, it's who is the dev of the Okay, so are we... Yeah, are we yeah we no, we get to go. We get to any camera, whichever you want. All right, so you know, I went to the restroom, had a... <laughs> got my thoughts together. Uh, 
So my question is, well, personally, I, I'm unsure if I agree as uh, someone that hasn't been in the course, uh, been an outsider. I, I'm unsure if I agree that the technical coordinator should also be the lead developer in the sense of doing the most development. I feel as though, as you said, the development is a bottleneck. The backend development is a bottleneck, and I think the backend developer should just focus on that while the technical coordinator should be working on that as well, but in a lesser role so they can focus on the technical coordinator aspect. I, and I need to pause you. I'll, so there's three positions. Uh, th 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 you, should, you should start this over right, and cut this part. There's three positions. There's the tech coordinator who just talks to a few people mm -hmm. a few hours. Well, I know, I know in y'all's. I was right. just saying in your proposal one earlier. But the, but I, I think I think you're making a really good point, but I think your point is about the dev lead, which is not the tech coordinator necessarily, well, um, and the back-end developer. So the the work that bogs you down is not tech coordinator. So it's, it's, it's back-end development that bogs mm -hmm. you down. That is a heavier side. Yeah, but by, by a factor of 10. Technical coordinator, you're just sending a few emails to a land administrator, you're maybe sending a few emails to the other team, and then you're doing some school server maintenance, which might take up five to seven hours or more if you're messing it up. Back in development is 20 plus hours a week. Okay, well, Ooh. I, so, um, my I question is more framed off of I, how you all proposed earlier, the combination of how whoever your lead developer should be, yeah. should be your uh, technical coordinator as well. And uh, I guess there's maybe confusion in uh, labels in terms of lead developer. Do you mean making decisions? Or as in, because I know for you, you're the lead and backend developer. Oh. And so are you guys proposing splitting up those roles back into separate and combine take the lead portion and combine with technical yeah, coordinator? Yeah, so, so Whatever's going on in the back end, right. kind of like Chris said earlier, is is gonna set the pace for how the how it's going. And the reason that's the dev lead is because the back end is 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 the architecture of the application. Mm -hmm. So the it's dev gravity. yeah, the dev lead is deciding the architecture and then implementing it. So I didn't as the dev lead, I didn't have a lot of. Uh, leadership type responsibilities my main pro my main role was to I saw how the application had to work and I and I put the pieces together and then and then I wrote the code to make it happen the only leading I did or management I did was the the school server which like Chris said take maybe 10 hours yeah. uh, throughout the whole course yeah. and then um, and then kind of telling people, hey, I, I need this done or I need that done. And then other than that, I mean, as far as the back end goes, I made all those decisions, but I didn't have anybody to talk to. I was also implementing those decisions. And, and two caveats on that. I push back on the lack of leadership because uh, as so project manager, especially during the meet phase, the, the development phase, I did not crawl into the technical progress. I went to Eric at, at a stand-up meeting every week or maybe every few days and I said, what is the current progress? What does the GUI look like? What is the what is database, data migration, which was kind of a specific task for us that might not exist in every project. Yeah. So, and, and I think Eric's selling his leadership role short. He coordinated all of that and represented it to me as the project manager. It, that alone freed me up at least two hours a week to do other things in re related to strategic planning because I didn't need to crawl into Ruby on Rails. I didn't need to open up a console, look at the code, see what was new, boot up the server, take a look at it. Uh, and the other thing I was going to say is that Eric and a, and a dev lead by definition serves as a quality assurance. And we were talking earlier about mm -hmm. the, the splitting. It. It, yeah, we were talking earlier about the splitting and merging branches and he is the sole proprietor of what branches get accepted, what doesn't get accepted. He headed off many technical conflicts. And, excuse me, but basically your question was, is that gonna to be too much work, mm -hmm. right? Well, if you're, if, if, the, if the person that's the most familiar with the code is not also the person in charge of how the code's going, they're not gonna know, they're not, it's, it's faster for the person that's the most familiar with the code to be the dev lead and to be the tech coordinator 
than it is for another person to check in with that person, check in with the, the front end guy, and so it's just, so I, 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 when I would look at the merge requests, I would know if something was gonna work just because I had been in the code so much, and when I was setting up the school server, I knew what I had to do because I knew what the code was what needed. So, so yeah. it's, it's, it is a lot, but, but it's less than if I was, if I was a separate dev lead. Right. Does that answer your question? That was a, yeah, that's a very uh, deep. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think he, I don't think he did. It did. So, well, okay, so uh, I feel like there may be distinction in the vocab. So, whenever we are we say lead developer, uh -huh. are we talking about lead and design decision, or back end workload, or a combination of both? Because I I see a couple different options. I see pulling the the leadership, stripping that from mm -hmm. uh, what your role was and throwing that to the technical coordinator. Mm -hmm. But in what you just said, it seems like the person who does the heaviest coding workload should also be the person making those decisions as the most familiar with the code. So I've seen a couple different, I feel like it's two different ideas or all uh, the second, said. The second way you described it okay, is, that is, is the more accurate. Is board. where okay. the place where the bulk of the work and knowledge exists is where we put that leadership role as well. The technical coordinator, don't try not to get wrapped around that. The technical coordinator's list of role of responsibility it's, server, yeah. it's, it's very small. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the word coordinator almost gives it a little bit too much authority. You're, it, commu it's a communication based role. The dev lead is where the knowledge existed, which by definition is also where the pacing existed for technical progress. And that's why I was saying the dev lead should be the tech coordinator because whoever is the tech coordinator is the person that's going to be installing the database, installing whatever version of Rails, and, and pulling the repository onto the server. So since you're already in the server, you might as well be the tech coordinator. And to the description that you gave, uh, from a different team perspective, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, I'll go ahead and share a little bit about that. So I personally was the project manager, but at the same time, I was also the lead developer. So that's a change for you. Right. Did you really uh, develop? Yes, I, I, know know I developed pretty much. I knew you were good at uh, in, in Ruby, but I didn't know you were the developer as yes. well. Yeah, I was. Uh, and you however, greedy, man. Gotta get in there, yeah. However, uh, to your point and a little bit of what you said, Eric, um, that there's a, there's a, I think in my opinion there's a piece of leadership that goes into actually developing mm -hmm. because there's right. decisions that you have to take that both involve the design of the application whether it be tables right, right. whether yeah. it be certain code certain features um, at least for my team it worked out really well that I was the lead developer um, mostly because you had the vision already so exactly. it's a lot easier to exactly it's a lot easier for me to you know kind of gauge the code and say okay what is most important what can i take out what do i focus on right right and the way my team kind of worked was so i kept the engine going in terms of developing the main application everybody else supported that right so i had my technical coordinator uh if there was anything you know that needed to kind of like maintenance or setup right, he right. was the one that took care of it while well, always kept you know head on into the main uh, developing of the application. Right, right. Uh, and, and this is a little bit to the side, but documentation, uh, a lot of the technical documentation, other people handled that. So I didn't have to, you know, have my head in that. Right, right, Most right. of my attention just went straight to the code. If there was a change that needed to be made, uh, I would consider it, uh, figure out the impact it would have, you know, documentation, uh, maybe set up of the server. Right. Uh, so it was really good, in my opinion, that I did that just because I had probably the most broad knowledge of what was going on, whether it, it, in terms of the application documentation. From the client side or from the developer side? <laughs> Both. Both. Really. Right, right. So Both, it helped. Really. Okay, yes. Yes. so it worked yes. out. Yeah. Yes. Jesus. So actually, uh, that leads me to my next question, which actually uh, is submitted by Troy. Uh, a lot of you know Troy, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I work with him. Uh, great Troy. guy. <laughs> What's up, Troy? Anyways, one of his questions was, what, what was the biggest challenge when it came to uh, application design? And then you kind of like already hinted at it that you already had the vision. Yeah. But for us, like the same with Eric actually. Eric was our client liaison. Uh, you guys have any since both of y'all developed, what any tips for like the application design? Like like I already touched on the ERD, data dictionary, but yeah. you might guys might have some two cents. So since a couple classes back, the way I think about when I start, you know, kind of thinking about an uh, application is through data. How do I want the data? to look within the database and if it's gonna make sense. So I kind of start almost in a sense backwards 
and then work my way up. Okay. So essentially, uh, I start, you know, kind of making up the IVs uh, and making up makeup tables on a piece of paper right, and right. say, okay, this repair order is going to have this, mo this amount of line items. How can I make this look good in a database that will make sense right, right, right. in an application? Right. So I look at the data, try to make it transform it to make sense within a table. And that's when I start thinking about the tables, you know, how many do I need? Right. Am I going to need associative tables? Or is so it just the ERD, it goes back, that was back to the data exactly, exactly. the, the, the dictionary. Yeah, and however though, um, you kind of also have to think uh, not just backend, so not just database. Uh, one, of the, one of the tips, I forget where I heard it, I might have read it or watched a YouTube video on it, uh, but the approach to an application, if you're taking it just from a database standpoint, it's not going to be a great application. So you kind of have to think through the scenarios, how it's going to be used. So okay. essentially that's where I come from. How does the data going to make sense in the database? Right, right. You know, kind of start thinking about how the system is going to be used, whether it be GUI, uh, user experience, and then kind of put that together. Branch all together. Exactly. And Before then that'll development. Create, yeah, though. that'll start creating uh, a very good base where you to start building features on top. So if I were to say <coughs> design, First and then develop. Don't do any development until you design, unless it's for testing the actual Sorry. design yes. itself, right? Yeah. So okay. yes. you didn't use uh, agile development. No, we didn't. Uh, we really it was more of a waterfall. So mm. it was a lot of design. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Well, for obviously for, for that part, for that yeah. Obviously yeah. first analysis, you know, kind of design, and then you know make it into actual code. Okay. Uh, and then once we got into the code, we figured actually figured out a few things that weren't going to work as we planned. Uh, and specifically because of some of the constraints we found with RELS uh, and the complexity of it. So we kind of redid a little bit of what we designed, but it still ended up working well. We kind of redid a little bit of design, but again, analysis came first, design, right, right, right. Right. then build, you know, so yeah, you're seeing that you, and for the most part, you did waterfall, yeah. uh, which yeah. ironically is, is not what the professor says, but it actually worked out for yeah. y'all yeah. very well. Did for us. Well, and, and, I mean, he, so he didn't demonize waterfall. That's true. That's true. Yeah. He, it's and so to, to juxtapose that, we had kind of an I won't call it agile because that might be too generous. We maybe didn't meet the bar for agile, but it was definitely iterative. Right. So the way we did it was instead of like Kevin said, he, he focused on the data. We focused more on breaking down each function of the application. We called it modules. I think most people would call it modules. So. We had we had an, we had our our client had a need for a, a general need, and then we could break that down into a few sub needs, I guess. Yeah. And what we did was we we coded and we we designed and then programmed each module. And the thing the thing the good thing about that is you'll always have something that works at some point. Once you yeah. finish the first module, you have something that works. Right. And um, and then and then you're like, okay, that requirement's out of the way. Let's go to the next one. Let's go to the next one. And as you as you go further down, you'll find that some of the stuff you already made will kind of help you f do the next thing faster. Yeah. So um, that enables. So, so that's a, that's another way to do it. You can you can focus on the data or you can focus on the functionality. It's two yeah. totally different ways to do it that will both work. Yeah, and I think that also has to do with how you know different applications work. For, for sure, uh, business that they're right, right, for obviously yeah. no application is going to be the same. So yeah. you, I think you have to take into consideration, you know, how you your application is going to be used. What really, what is yeah. it really? Uh, right, your your application was supposed to be saving data. Exactly. Ours was more operational. Exactly. Yeah, so yeah. you can't be a rigid programmer. Right, go into this and say this is always how I code. Exactly. You yeah. have to be flexible. You have to let the reality of the current business process and the business process you're trying to get to for your client, exactly. you have to let the reality of those two things impact how you lay out your, sure. your production. Exactly. Real quick, I think it would be helpful. Um, Y'all did membership tracking for a gym, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. We, we can't dive too much into the actual gym itself. Well, I, I just wanna like know so that they- Right, right, right. Yeah. so, so uh, yeah. our it's team, fair to say yeah. it's a membership activity tracker. Right, right, right. We right, were concerned right. primarily with attendance and we, right. we, for, we created some algorithms and functionality that helped extrapolate future attendance using prior attendance. Right. Um, and, and, and it had the capacity to take in on, you know, current numbers and, and keep, in, keep informing that function. It was like a day-to-day -day thing for the, 
for the client. Like our client, every yeah. day they would have to do probably right. several times during their shift would have to do something on a spreadsheet. Right. We made it easier. Yeah, sure. they looked at a dashboard sure. and it said things like, "Today I need to call these two people. I need to catch these two people as they walk in, and these five classes we anticipate they will have." This many people. Right, and theirs was a little bit different. Yeah, what yeah, was ours, yeah, what was your so ours was a repair order service and warranty tracking system. So it was for an iPhone repair, uh, or not necessarily just iPhones, but it was a phone <laughs> repair uh, shop that was running just on paper. Everything that came in, any repair was recorded on paper, passed on to technicians. Uh, any details was always on paper and no digital. There was really weak tracking of warranty, so there was a lot of loss going on uh, yeah. in terms of warranty. Um, abuse. taking advantage of it. Yeah, abuse. Uh, yeah. Abuse, exactly. Um, so our application was more of a really order entry into the system. Right. Uh, right. Capturing yeah. data of the customer, capturing data of the, the phones, uh, you know, and what was being fixed. Uh, and then based off of that data, you could create uh, essentially really good statistical reports into, you know, what's being repaired the most, whether it be a device, whether it be a certain part. Um, yeah, and then with the data collected, obviously it could have been expanded a lot more. Right, right. But you know, you want to keep it uh, it's not a small scope where it'll constrain you. You know, your ability yeah. to exercise enough functionality for this for the project. Right, right. But just enough uh, functionality that you know it'll be enough to practice your Ruby skills and, and obviously help the business. Well, well, actually, you actually both of y'all brought up a really good point as far as for advice for finding a client. I think. The more the the best I think the ideal client is those that use paper for any type of task whatsoever. That is probably the best uh, potential client you can find. If you have a client that's already using CRM, ours did, but they were still using half. Uh, there's there's some portions of it that they were still on paper or they weren't being used. So that way that's why it resulted as a good client. But for the most part, if you find a client or know some client uh, some business small business that uses paper for most of their stuff or very simple uh, technologies like Excel sheets still. Those are probably the best uh, potential clients you can get. So if you find those or know about them, those are the ones you should, uh, you know, die, uh, you know, uh, interview or whatnot and gather information for for the project. And I think something we should say at this point, uh, we're going to endeavor during this panel and discussion to avoid putting words in the professor's mouth. Right. Um, but there are definitely constraints about what you can promise a client. Uh, there's financially based constraints. There's health information based constraints. And we, we're not going to list those constraints because we don't want to take a chance at being wrong or maybe misunderstanding, but it's worth it to know that as soon as you have a client and a basic idea of a problem you might solve for them, immediately run that by the professor because there, there are things that you can't pass go with. Um, and if you're watching this before the class, there's uh, these were the, the rules before we started was uh, it couldn't be it couldn't be a uh, what inventory application? Inventory, yeah. no inventory. And there was something else. Financial, be... no financial whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. So, no if, so if you've already got a client in mind and then you're thinking it's an inventory application, try to think of something. Else. And yeah. to be very specific about financial, it means like no credit card payments at all. No, no, I mean no payments yeah. tracking whatsoever. When it comes to uh, other aspects of financial, you can track like how much it's been costing me to do something. For example, a thing in your project, you kept track of how much money they would spend on the uh, on, on ordering parts, parts for that case. Yeah. So that that is actually a viable thing, but not tracking payments itself and yeah. like in you, you, right. you couldn't handle for example invoicing exactly yeah right he, right he could the your client could use your app and understand a dollar figure attached to phone screens exactly. but you you would not be allowed to create something that would send an invoice yeah. to phone screens Inc exactly. and get order yes I mean it's it's essentially you don't want to replicate QuickBooks yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. right right exactly. you want to do something custom uh, but uh, original enough uh, that you know you're not replicating an already existing application. Right, they right. Pay, you know three or four dollars a month yeah. and very easily apply to their yeah. business. And, and one, one quick segue right here, guys. We dive really deep into the tech. I have one quick, uh, one last question from the tech side, and obviously both of y'all work on the tech side. Uh, again from Troy, he says, "What was the biggest challenge when it came to development, to coding itself?" Mm -hmm. uh, and Keep, try to keep it as technical as possible because that's exactly what they want to hear. Is like they want to know yeah. exactly what technical problems you face. Like, yeah. yeah, I'm not gonna give you examples, but basically that. That's kind of what the question is. Well, I would say in our case, um, because of our application and how it worked, it involved inputting data to actual actually 
more than four tables at the same time with one transaction. Oh wow! Yeah, that's right. Yes. Jesus. Yeah. So it was it's a lot of normalization. The way you set it up, right? The year. Yes. Device? Yes. So it was a lot of nested forms essentially. So you oh, had, so wow. you had forms. You had you you did it really good on the Ruby class. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you were the yeah. first one to get it. Yeah. So and actually that helped it from the Ruby class. Right, right. It translated into you know the summer class, uh, but it was essentially four nested. Well, it was really more than that, uh, but it was more than four nested forms. Right, right. one form that would submit to more than four tables in one transaction. Okay. Um, because of how our ERD was set up in the beginning, um, it was only really working for, I think, three of them. And the problem was oh. some of the relationships ended up not making sense. And so this is where uh, I talked a little bit earlier where we went back and actually edited a little bit of our design. Right. Uh, and it worked perfectly after we kind of edited it. Uh, it, it was it was really awesome <laughs> right, when right. you got it to work, but you know it's that it's, it's that uh, kind of segue between your design and getting your actual functionality to work where it's the toughest part, uh, and then sometimes it'll make you rethink and don't be afraid to rethink you know your design, right, right, because sometimes if you rethink your design, honestly it'll make your life easier. Yeah, I mean I spent hours nights trying to trying to you know, make our solution fit our previous design, it just wasn't working. Right. And so right. I just said to myself, okay, I'm gonna restart. It's gonna start from the bottom, you know, rethink my DRD, see if it makes sense. And about 20 minutes, I had figured it out. Just starting from the bottom That's again. Cool. I think it's a really good point is that, that Ruby is, Ruby else is for the purpose of you can easily rescaffle. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. And Git, you can always roll back exactly. yeah. to where you started yeah. from. Did, did you, I mean, obviously you're my team, but still, like, I know that like, there's some challenges that you probably just kept to yourself because they weren't worth mentioning, but is there something worth mentioning to another developer? And I know there's students that probably are working on the same role that you are, and you're probably like, hey, what would you tell yourself, basically, to avoid or to not do, or something that you were like, damn it, that was way too much of a hassle? Gosh, um... <laughs> <laughs> that was like a laundry list, like, all yeah. well, oh, this no, sucks. Well, actually, it's, it's actually kind of hard to pinpoint one thing for me. Um, I, it was interesting to hear Kevin's side of the story about that because I will not change my design. I would make things work <laughs> the way I designed it to work. And um, Granted, we had a really pretty good design. Right well, yeah, we had a pretty good design to be fair. It wasn't, in, I don't think any part of it was inherently stupid. We had that weird ERD at first that we had to change. Yeah, I was, I was about to say, that. very early on, yeah. we did do something exactly like Pretty what Kevin stupid, said, yeah. but we hadn't really started development at that point. Right, and to, to kind of put it in the context, at one point I was I was writing a controller and I had, I had a four-dimensional array and it, I actually... Yeah, I, I never told all about that, but I had a four-dimensional array to get something so to work. Hey. Yeah, that's when I was like, something is wrong with the ERD, I need to rethink this. Yeah. But yeah. So Kevin's way is probably more the right way, especially when you have Rails and Git on your yeah. side. You can roll back, re-scaffold, stuff like that. Um, my biggest challenge, I think, would actually be data filtering. Um, I... I it took me a couple of tries to learn how to do the searching by different um, parameters. Yeah, parameters, right, yeah. and um, and that was kind of a pain. And I just know all the applications out there now. You start typing in something, and it you oh, know it geez. researches yeah. as you do it. Yeah, it starts I, truncating that table. Yeah, up yeah, up. yeah. And I figured that out kind of near the end. And as as a developer, I was a little bit embarrassed because that's something you should know. And um, but. Yeah, go with what Kevin said. Don't try to force a design that don't, doesn't work. I did it, and um, and it worked for a while. And if you, and some some of the later coding actually probably looks a little ugly, to be honest with you, because of me trying to just force it. Yeah, yeah, just jam yeah. that design in. Because when you write that first design, uh -huh. you are by definition the most ignorant about your solution yeah. and how to meet your requirements out of any point in the project. As you proceed, as you work, as you code, as you further analyze your analysis, you become more informed. So you should absolutely be willing exactly. and open to redesigns in light of your in increased understanding of right. what yeah. needs to be. That's where the agile comes in. Right? Yeah, it's kind of yeah. funny how y'all did agile, yet it was the rigid to design. Yeah. So you did waterfall, and they were like, yeah. oh, we'll just redo it. Even though he did waterfall, he still uh, approached an agile mm -hmm. kind of like to, to the development yeah. side. Yeah. Like clearly, he redesigned halfway through, mm -hmm. but he still approached uh, this design first, then code, then this. Yeah. But he still 
I don't know how to. It's really hard. It's not really hard. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's a hybrid. And it was like a waterfall, and then it was just like, just tear down this waterfall. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and start back over. Yeah. Yeah. Which is kind of. I feel like some PMs yeah. are flipping it. Like, yeah. like <laughs> what? Oh, <Whoa>, man. <laughs> tear down this waterfall. Yeah. <laughs> Probably say this. Yeah, just about uh, to say, yep. In yep. the industry, it, that happens. You know, sometimes there's a hybrid uh, involvement of both waterfall and I, agile. You know, and, yeah. unified. It's super. And, you know, it's super trendy right now to say, "Oh, we're agile," and almost always, to a certain degree, it's right. Sounds Mo- yeah, yeah, I'm sure it works at bars too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Agile. <laughs> everyone, hey, like, everyone wants to go to their. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone wants to go to their local tech convention and be like, "Yeah, we're totally agile." But yeah. you know what? It, we're not old. It it does. Yeah, we're not. Yeah, we're we're young. Yeah. We're hip. We're, <laughs> we're in line with the latest management tech methods. Right. But honestly, there are times when an, a basic agile no a finishes, b starts. There's times when you need to borrow from both. And uh, and this is where I push back on a lot of the current industry of project management. I, I don't demonize that. I, I think a combination, a hybrid of waterfall and agile is, I mean, that's, when the when the rubber hits the road, oftentimes that's what works best. I should, I should have mentioned that in the beginning. Something that really helped uh, both teams is the fact that both of these gentlemen are project manager. Uh, they were doing, inter- you all were doing internships, right? As, yes. as project yeah. managers, yeah. plus taking the project management course. So obviously, during the day, you were gaining experience as PM, and then during yeah, the night, you were implementing yeah. those experiences and those um, methodologies. So I think, you know, granted, I, I, this sounds biased, but I think we, you guys were the most prepared to be PMs during this class. So I'm sure it's, it, tra- and I'm sure it transpired in yours. I know it transpired in our team. Oh, so, yes, yes. Uh, and, to, and to give credence to this class, I mean, if it'll make you care about this class a little bit more, especially if you're interested in project management, uh, Kevin, you know, I, I want you to give your opinion right after this statement, but the experience of leading a team in this class very similar to leading an enterprise level team oh, yes. at a at a you know Fortune right. 500 1000 you know whatever company exactly. and was that your experience as well? I would say yes. Uh, actually, during the summer of this course, it was actually my second uh, project management internship. I had previous uh, last summer I was also project manager intern and then actually stayed on as a project coordinator. So yes, I did actually let. Uh, small to medium sized enterprise project for the course of six months uh, and I would say it was very translatable yeah. uh, obviously awesome. you, you know see. Kind of <laughs> yeah. see if it holds out because <laughs> yeah. yeah, everyone goes to school and they're like yeah okay but how relevant is this really and we can say with some confidence in this specific case Pay attention if you want to do this. Yeah. Oh, was, uh, yeah. If you're a CIS major, you're on the right one. It's biased, but you're in the right major. <laughs> it will be interesting because I'm like I'm not the same time, but I just I did a project coordinator sure. this the summer, and so now we'll see like the follow up. See how much I remember first off, and <laughs> see uh, see how that translates over. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of the processes, the steps that you would follow in enterprise, are very helpful yeah. for when you take this class. A lot of the good habits are exactly. important in both. Exactly. So you would say that's kind of like how and why uh, you chose to be a project manager, how you prepared to be a good project manager. In fact, you first of all you liked it, and you've tried it out elsewhere before taking the class. Mm-hmm. Those are actually two of the questions that uh, uh, Roger had. I'm not sure if you all met Roger. Roger yeah. uh, exactly. He actually oh. the first question he asked was like, and, and quote unquote, is that why the hell did you want to be a PM in the first place? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Yeah, but but that's a more abstract question. Why did you want to be a PM? So I personally like the sense of responsibility and accountability. Yeah. Um, previous semesters uh, in the CIS program, I ended up in a group where we ended up with the biotech as our project manager. So it was a PM, but it was, it was also uh, gone after the uh, the first semester. Yeah, so he did die. Actually, no, it's he didn't. He died, dude. He, was, he died in my heart. Oh, <laughs> I was like, damn, what happened to Evan, man? No, uh, I couldn't save him. <laughs> so, uh, actually, that experience, that, that actually was really what uh, inspired me to, you know, kind of grab hold of, you know, what we would go through in the upcoming class, which was 3343, uh, uh, Professor Gibbs. I was ready. To, I mean, before I went into the class, I was ready to be project manager because that's good. Uh, you yeah. know, I wanted to make sure that both my education uh, and the accountability was there, so that I can control. You know, essentially my grade, cool. uh, and I could you know have the ability to have a strong say 
uh, control your life projects. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. Have your life by the point. Uh, I'm sure you had the same way, same train. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I've come at uh, project management, uh, and what I'll call it more broadly, small unit leadership. Uh, I, I've come at that from a, from a, a prior background uh, in the military. Um, oftentimes, much right. more stressful circumstances than perhaps you'd find even in Professor Dettelier's class. Um, but uh, I <laughs> deal with knock on wood for the rest of the class. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Yeah, you keep talking then. Oh, it's just a little screen. Um, so, so I was coming at this with a little bit of comfort um, with, uh, with, you good? No, no, it's good. I, I'm recording both the cameras, by the way. Okay. So, so, yeah. so, so this was Amy. the shot. Was that? John in the shot. Yeah, but he's in that shot. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. in that shot. There's two cameras? Yeah, yeah. 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 That's what I'm getting, yeah. Why are you prepping yourself? I gotta fix this thing going uh, 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 uh. That's why I'm sitting right here, because this is my good side. Uh, this, is, this is where my hair, my hair is. There you go. You can keep um, So I was coming at this with a little bit of prior experience uh, in small unit leadership. Um, so I was very comfortable, uh, to be perfectly frank, I was very comfortable taking the fall uh, for something I was in charge of. That, I think that's one of the biggest traits you can have mm -hmm. as a leader, is just being willing to stand up and say, yeah, this, this is my fault. Yeah. Regardless of whose fault it was, yeah. regardless of what could have been done better by whoever, the, being a leader means you're responsible. You could have done something, you mm -hmm. could have led it a different way. And I just have a personal just affinity for making sure that the people who are working hard next to me and underneath me don't, they're, they're shielded from that kind of thing. Um, and I kind of want to give you guys a little from where this question came from. Obviously, Roger asked it, but there's a reason. It's because he's considering being a project manager, but he's actually taking four classes alongside the capstone. I'm not sure if it's four plus the capstone Jesus. or four with the capstone. Uh, but on top of that, he actually belongs. Oh, okay. The battery is dead or All right, we'll take a little a little break then. Okay. So the reason for this question is actually because uh, Roger is actually debating on becoming a project manager for this class, but he's also taking four other classes. Plus, he actually belongs to our organization as an officer, and he's working part time. I mean, me personally, I wasn't a PM, but I can definitely say that's going to be hard. Even if it is on a regular semester, even if it's not the summer, it's still going to be very hectic. But I want you guys, y'all's two cents, because you were the actual PM. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. Well, actually, actually, I will first. say it's going to be a, quite a happy load. Um, I actually worked as a project coordinator and was project manager for the second database class, and I. Honestly, I didn't feel motivated in some of the instances to do right, some right. of the work. And uh, so because of that, I think some of the quality was lacking in one of the courses uh, and the work we did. So I would say think about it, uh, especially with four courses. I took five courses at the time with the second database class. And I worked pretty, oh, much, 65, 30, yeah, yeah. Yeah, pretty much 32 hours a week. Um, it was tough. So. Right. I mean, it's doable, but it will be tough. Yeah, right. and, and just, I mean, he's, he's mostly giving the answer, but honestly, the capstone, I put in more hours per week as a project manager, I think most of us did, than any other college course I'd ever taken, uh, by a large sure. margin. I mean, we were expecting, and this is summer, I, I, I understand that during the fall and spring, <clears throat> it should be like 10 to 15 hours a week or something like that. We were basically like 15 to 20 hours a week. That's true. I, and that by a large margin, that's more per week than I've had to give of myself to any other class, any other academic endeavor. Uh, I, gave, I immediately gave up my, my side income as a personal trainer. Uh, the only reason I was able to be a successful project manager intern is because I, to be frank, cut deals with my employer about working on their time on project, on university items. Um, and that was kind of with the understanding that like, yeah, I'd get all my stuff on and I would be biased towards kind of staying with them when they made me an offer. Uh, right, right. So, so I gave him that concession. Uh, honestly, for, for, for the Roger is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be perfectly frank. If you're taking four classes along with Capstone and you're an officer of, of what I'm AITP or some, some similar group. Right, right. Uh, so I, that's how we label it. You have to be yeah. specifically because of those reasons. And, and you're working. I I really think you should think about taking on a less friction 
uh, you know, like like a less oh, tumultuous man. role. And right, you right. you're not doing your team any favors if you're yeah. That, that's that's, that's another thing. It's thing. not yeah. about just you, right, uh, Roger? That with all due respect, it's also like affecting the team and overall progress. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned it because, in my opinion, I thought it was going to be tough. And you guys are pretty much like nailing the same thing. Uh, well, another question that he did ask was how, on average, and it, on average is kind of hard because this class is always the same thing. Uh, how did your day look like? And I'm sure he's asking for a perspective, of, like sure. not necessarily from when you woke up, what you do, but like throughout the day, how do you mentally prepare? How do you actually execute any tasks of that nature? Yeah. So I mean, in the morning, obviously work to the after to, to the after. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the things Chris said previously, you know, you kind of have to make sure that your employer is aware of what you're doing uh, and make sure you have flexibility to leave the office early if you have to. Because, uh, I mean, you're going to have to meet, you're going to have to meet with your client at some point uh, and they're not going to be able to meet, you know, with you maybe after your, your, your uh, work hours. So I would say make sure your employer uh, is, is flexible with you. However, so my day, you know, I would go to work uh, and if I had to leave early, I had the flexibility. Uh, but, and then after that, I would meet with my project team at the University of Houston, um, anywhere to 10, uh, 9, maybe 11 o'clock, depending on, the, on, you know, at which point we were in the summer. Um, but I will say they're, they're going to be long days. Uh, obviously, you know, with work, I would be at work 8.30, so I was waking up at 7 to get there. I was getting home 11, 11.30. So it will be tough, and those are you know on your little bit less stressful days. Right, um, right. On the easy come days. crunch time, you'll be you know past twelve working on on certain items. Uh, yeah. And so, I mentioned that on the previous video, they said this class is not to be taken lightly. As far as like, oh yeah, I can still work thirty hours. I actually recommend it if you're working more than twenty five or thirty two hours, you actually cut it down yeah, it, yeah. as much as possible. Not because you can't do it, but it's just going to affect, it's going to be like domino effect for, towards everything else. And yeah. even though this might be a joke but to some, but it actually affects your personal life as far oh, yeah. as like your relationships and any, yeah. your family, uh, friends and whatnot, your actual social life. It's going to be deeply affected if you work more than 25, 32 hours. So I think that's kind of like what is ranges and I'm sure your day was pretty similar. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I won't even repeat that because my day looked exactly like that. The one thing, and I'll make it quick to reiterate, is that when you're logging we'll say 15. I think it was a minimum of 15 for us, for a lot of us. When you're logging 15 hours a week, and every week you have to defend those hours to the professor, you will display to a, to a person, to a team member, you will display all 15 hours, what you did with those 15 hours, and then there should be some kind of concrete evidence in the status report, key accomplishments that what you're doing ended up being relevant. Right, right. Um, that makes sense. And, in other, in other classes, you often hear the professor say, for every hour of lecture, I expect two hours of study. And, uh, and me personally, I don't think, even when I was really interested in the class, I didn't reach two hours yeah. per, per lecture hour. But, that's actually, uh, yeah, that's actually a really good point yeah. because uh, uh, this class, we know we're all solely talking about the project itself. There's obviously, obviously a lot of quizzes and tests that you have to prepare for. And quite frankly, he does not care yeah. in regards to like your time wise. Like you cannot say, oh I spent two hours studying. Like it just should not be accounted for in the status report. It should not be accounted in your work time at all. It should just be something you do and you manage yourself. Yeah. And one of the questions actually uh, Troy asked us as well was like how did you as PM manage that? Uh, and obviously as a team we, I can also add my two cents, but primarily as a PM, how'd you manage to manage the team? You know, and also uh, studying because studying, although for us it was, uh, I think for the regular class as well, it was like for the first half of the semester, it's the quiz and test, and sure. then afterwards the project. But during the first half, I'm sure you can agree, it's probably one of the hardest t uh, parts because you have to get it all set in stone, ready to go. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would say that the best way to handle the studying uh, for the first half of the course, um, you it's not easy, easy. Yeah, th there's really not a good, I'm trying to think of a good key tip. Right. You just have to read the material. Uh, so, the, okay, so here's something concrete to say that would help. The professor is going to give you, uh, he's going to indicate two separate textbooks that you need to have when you're taking this course. One of them is called the Project Management Book of Knowledge, uh, and, there's an, and there's an outsized chance that if you're watching this video, it's going to be version six that you're concerned with. And there's also a reference textbook, uh, whose name escapes me, but it's, I think that one's actually the Pinbok, right? The uh, bigger one? The bigger one's the Pinbok, absolutely. Yeah, and, yeah. and the Pinbok. There's a reference, I think it was. I there's a reference the book that yeah. we didn't. Okay, so we didn't use that reference no, book. No, no, it was not much. used for That's the point I'm trying to arrive at. He's going to advise you to get that reference book. And if you're concerned with, 
IT project management, as many of us are, it behooves you to have that book in your library, but if you're just looking to worry about the grades you get in the first half of this course, that PIMBOK book should pretty much be where you put all of your study hours into. Right, right. And actually, I mentioned that in the previous video, and I personally did not do it to a full, and I admitted in the video, said so read the book beforehand. Like typically, I mean, at least for the Tilly, he actually messaged us saying that this is gonna be the syllabus, this is the actually breakdown, this is the book, and he actually messaged us like, what, like two weeks, three weeks ahead of time? And yeah, around that time, right? So in the previous video, I recommended is to read the book, or at least some chapters prior to the class starting, so that when you have to allocate okay. time to not study, you already have studied those chapters. So there is no escaping the, you know, the quizzes and tests, or regardless of how you do it, you still have to allocate some time to study, whether you do it before the class starts or in between. So. This is where all those you know, schedule comes into play and how you measure that. And uh, just real quickly, I'm told by my handsome dev lead that the uh, reference book is Information Technology Project Management, 8th okay. edition by a Kathy, Kathy Schwab. Yeah, so, so Schwab. I, the, the biggest thing I would tell you is park your study hours in the PIMBOK, the Project Management Book of Knowledge. That's going to give you the most bang for your buck in terms of five minutes of studying got me two more points. Right, right. So, that's the biggest thing. This, or, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so, um, wondering from previous experience, experience uh, sort of a combination of answering the previous question of project management, too much time, uh, spent on other things, yada yada. Uh, if it's really about accountability, not only do you have to hold yourself accountable, but other people. And so, if you set aside the time to actually be able to work through a checklist, say, I need to check with this person, and this person, and this person, and I think. I don't know what y'all's experience has been. I know you had a conglomerate of a bunch of different roles. Um, so you may not have had to do this, but checking in with people individually to update and make sure you know exactly what's going on in a project. And it's sort of similar with your own study. Uh, be very strict with your hours. Have the accountability to say, I'm working on this, but I blocked off these two hours to study. I'm going to stop. The other two, the, two, true, the other things can be diverted. I sit down this schedule. If I follow it, I should be successful. If I did a good job plotting everything out, if before the semester I sat down and said, these are my hours for this, these are my hours for this, uh, I'm running over in this, I'm not gonna just push aside my other priorities, I have a set schedule, I'm transitioning, and I'll get back to it later after following up with everyone, and if need be, just be very communicative with your team and say, I have a little bit too much on my plate, yeah. Are you available for this? If that sounds correct to y'all, no, yeah. we, yeah, we had a very similar experience, especially in anticipation of final exam, midterm. They are interchangeable, interchangeable phrases when it comes to this specific course because you take your final exam at the halfway point. Uh, we, in anticipation of that big exam, we did manage our own expectations and our professor's expectations. We said something to the effect of our next status report is going to show 10 hours per person average because we we anticipate five extra hours of study time that's going to come at the expense of pro a project work. Uh, and if you look in the rubric, the weighted percentages of the grades support yeah, that decision. Like yeah. 40%? It's 30%, I believe? 35? 35? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No way. We it, 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 yeah. Yeah. It, it is a hefty enough percentage that it is worth taking five hours of project work away from each person and putting that into the next week, which is coincidentally how Professor Dutillier will phrase it. If you tell him, I'm take, as a project manager, I'm taking five hours away from my expectations of each member and I want them to use that time to study, that project manager is going to say something to the effect of, okay, next week I expect to see an extra five hours uh, to make up for this. And to be fair, the reason that that worked for us is because in the beginning, we knocked out like in almost the entire analysis phase about what two weeks before the we like were, the eighty percent of the work for the analysis phase we knocked out in the first yeah. since it was summer let's say the first twenty percent of the class and then and then yeah, so we were able to focus on the so the term one thing I want to touch on is because we already touched on like oh so allocating time to study to the project. But I think what makes it the, the most critical thing is planning ahead from the PM's perspective. And one of the questions actually Troy asked was like, how did you keep, uh, you know, any tips on keeping and making the meetings productive? Not just from like when you're in, in the meeting, but afterwards, because that plays a part in like how you allocate time afterwards to study. You know, if you have enough time and you know what you have to do. So 
I know, I know, obviously I worked on your team, but I want you to add the two sets for everyone else as well as cool. you. Yes. Well, yeah, Kevin, how, how would you say you ran your meeting? So, actually, what I encountered with my team was we figured out that, you know, driving time okay. was quite uh, a considerable amount of time to get to school. Um, so we actually started to meet, you know, just do Google Hangouts. Quick, 15-minute, oh, okay. sure, sure. 20-minute uh, meeting uh, where we can brainstorm, you know, kind of what we need to do. Uh, what, what we're doing, uh, sort of kind of like a, a, an agile stand-up, sure, sure, almost. Yeah. Um, we would kind of discuss, okay, we're going to do this, and then we cut the call really quickly and get to work. Um, and and to me personally, I I actually like to work more with people inside personal meetings. Um, but physically, yes, yeah, physically. Right, right, right. But um, uh, because of you know how other team members that the feedback they gave me, we decided to take that approach, uh, and, and it actually worked out very well. Uh, obviously, you sometimes you do get a lot more work done, uh, you know, by yourself. You know, yeah. getting getting through the steps uh, and then combining work with others. Right. Um, so that's that's a little bit how how we ran it. So yeah, and we we that was definitely part of our formula. We had a or I had a very specific equation for my meetings from week one. I think you yeah. Uh, I, this, this is what we're doing. Yeah. And this, right. yeah, this is one of the and this is probably one of the most important things. I think this is worth some time in this video, like an extra amount of time. Um, good, consistent communication and expectations about that communication really does drive a team forward. So we met four main times. Uh, the first time is before every lecture. Right. We would all, and at least, or at least most elements of the team, would get together before the lecture. We would do things like ask the professor a litany of questions. And what? we got really good at, write, at spending the whole seven days be between times we'd see him. We wrote down dozens of questions. We printed out documents for his review. And then I emailed them to him in advance. And I said, hey, just so you know, I've got you for an hour, respectfully. Right, right. I have you for an hour. Here are my questions that we're going to talk about for an hour, and here are my documents we're going to review for an hour. Which was key. And he responded to that well, too, because yes. he printed out those emails and had them ready when you got yeah. there, right? Yeah, yeah. Is that correct? That's a, yeah, a little correct. side tip. <laughs> for this, like, two tips that are really big, really important, but I'll, I'll mention that in another video more in detail. But definitely go to his office hours, and when you do, yeah. make sure you have a list of questions ready to ask. And if you can't, like, like Chris did, he actually messaged, uh, emailed it to the professor ahead of time, so he already knew what was coming in the hour, so there was no wasting time. Because you know, those office hours, at one point, at some point forward, it'll be critical. Every single minute will count towards like how you develop your project and the overall st state of your project. So you want to make sure you have all those questions lined up and answered before you leave that room. So I think, you know, I'll, I'll, I didn't mean to cut you off, no, I'll let you continue, no. but those are one things that I'm going to mention. I'll mention them in detail in another video, but for now, let's continue on this part. You should feel possessive of your professor's time. His time as a consultant is in your business case. He's got, a, he's got an hourly rate of $50, and you have to justify that $50 in your business case. And with all respect due his position, you should approach it as if he owes you an hour's time, because you've paid in this imaginary scenario, you've paid a certain amount that's represented in your business case to him of hours per week of consulting. He owes you those answers. It's up to you to take advantage of that. So we had team members show up for that, um, after every lecture, as a project manager, I would do what's called marching orders, which is just a military way to say, hey, for the next seven days, this is what I want each of you oriented towards. I mean, I would write it up. I would make it referable. You could go back and read it two or three days later and understand. It, it followed the schedule, but it was maybe a little more detail-oriented, and it basically communicated between me and each member of the team one-on-one, -on -one, hey, for the next seven days, this should be your focus. Don't get distracted with this task. It's there, but really, this is what's right in front of you. Um, so that was kind of like as you, like right in front of your face, this is what you should be doing. Right, right. We had a remote meeting every Thursday evening uh, that looked a lot, that functioned a lot how you, it was an agile meeting. The, at the beginning of the meeting, I had the leaders of the team, depending on what phase it was, update the whole team. So during the development phase, my meetings always kicked off with an update by Eric where he spent four minutes saying, hey, in the past seven days or four days, this is what's happened in the application. This is its current state. I would have a Thar, often my assistant project manager. She'd come in and say, hey, in the past seven or four days, this is what's happened with the project plan, which is a large binder that will be a very big center of gravity for your project. 
uh, and I would update the team overall. Hey, this is what our communications looked like recently with the professor. This is kind of some hiccups we've hit lately. And then after we had the major team leader updates, we would have individual discussion items. And I would create these agendas. I, as a personal rule, I push them out to the team at least eight to 12 hours prior to the meeting so that they could come up to me and say things like, hey, I think we should discuss this or hey, this isn't really worth the team's time, I'll just give you the answer now, and I, I would respect that, because we only had an hour, and you think an hour is a long time, but man, our, our meetings would be over quick. Yeah, that, that, that was a, that, yeah. And that's a good, th on, on Thursdays, our, our remote meeting was only an hour, so it's not like we were spending all night just talking each other to uh -huh. death about what happened, what's gonna happen. We, we got oriented, and then we yeah. pushed on. No work occurred during those Thursday meetings. Work was for Saturday collaborations, uh, which I'll start talking about in just a minute, and, and for afterwards, for like individual jam sessions between two or three people, oftentimes the dev team or my admin team, which is the other team we haven't talked about as much, but we had the team, the, the, our, our team basically split into two sub-teams, dev team elements and admin team elements. Uh, right, and that's actually a great segue into uh, the next part, which is actually more about tips, just you know, spitballing a bunch of tips, and one of the greatest things that I don't know why it never occurred to me or any other projects I've ever been on is that from day one, Chris immediately asked everyone their, their strengths, their weaknesses, and immediately divided us into sub-teams, which made it so much more clear throughout the semester knowing what you're responsible for, what you're accountable for, and what you have to work on, what you should worry about. And I'll let you talk about that because, I, I mean, in my opinion, even though it's not like re revolutionary, it's actually something that helped us out so much that I feel like if every team implemented that and practiced that, it would be so much better off the semester. Uh, we have a lot of philosophies in the infantry, uh, and one of the major philosophies in the infantry is that any given person can effectively control two to four people. If you, and, and you know, this is a, a subject to philosophical debate, but if you exceed four people that you are trying to control, every person you add is lessening your strategic ability to command those uh, elements. So what we do in the infantry is we have a squad leader who controls three, I'm sorry, we have a platoon leader who controls three squad leaders. We, each squad leader has three team leaders and each team leader has three to four elements underneath them that are just, you know, ground level operators. Right. Uh, it, I have never found a way in which that philosophy did not serve me well outside of the infantry in a military environment. Um, it, the most important thing you can do as a project manager, if you're watching this video, is identify elements in your team who have the capacity for leadership and authority and empower them to do so. Because they will make, A, everything works work better, but they will make your life as a project manager better. I was considered, I, I, I think I can be blunt, I was considered as a successful project manager by most of the people who interacted with me. Uh, hopefully all of them, but I would not have been successful yet. Yeah, he, he, <laughs> yeah, so. he did point out, he said, good leadership in the team, <laughs> not point at you. So I'm point that out real quick. I just feel like the people know, man. No, but, but that's different that, opinions on this shit. But, but that's a good point, because actually, Juan operated as one of my leaders uh, during the initial phases. That's a very important distinction. That's and true. then he realized his mistake and stripped it away. <laughs> I almost dropped out. I said, this is not for me, man. Like, <laughs> so during our early phases, we weren't concerned with coding and technical efforts. We were concerned with documentation, getting our project plan, which is an 80 to 150 page document up. Juan was my quality assurance manager, so he was just quality assurancing everything. Yeah. And as a result, I had Juan in a leadership role helping me pace the team. No, I, I was going to add to that, you know, obviously I did that part, but what helped me the most actually that something that the professor actually reiterated later on for the semester is that be very religious with the rubric and the syllabus. Yep. Despite whatever comments you hear about, you know, when you compare with other teams or what the professor says in class, he will always go by the rubric at the end of the day. So if you can bring that rubric with you to all the meetings, so every single time that you document, you, you know, you're verifying the, the document, the quality and whatnot, Always have the rubric handy, and whenever you have a question, that, write it down because that's one of the questions you're going to ask when you go to those office hours, yeah. regardless of what happens in class. Because the rubric is so complex and extensive that, you know, and, and I'm the, and in this case, I don't mean to throw the professor under the bus, but sometimes in class it's hard to keep track of the rubric, you know, by, by memory, right? So the professor might overlap, it might contradict some things, but at the end of the day, he's going to be like, I'm, I apologize, I meant this, this is what goes by the rubric. It didn't happen often, actually, I think it only happened once, but even then, 
you don't want to rely on just what happens in class, make sure you go after hours with the professor with those questions, guided by the rubric. That's just one of the, you know, it was, I guess, my secret weapon to be the, the, the QA for the team, but it's always handy to have the, the syllabus and the rubric. You know, have that as religious, follow that as religious as possible. Uh, that, that's actually a great segue into that. Uh, one thing actually we did, and I, actually, I brought it up as well, but I, we all uh, implemented in our team. I'm not sure how you guys did it, so I would love to do two cents on this. But from the very beginning, we actually made a timesheet on uh, Google Sheets on the cloud just because for convenience. This is how we kept track of what everyone's doing as far as status report goes. Uh, at first, if I, I don't know how we uh, mapped out without it, but if we didn't have the Google, uh, the Google Sheets, I'm sure it would be pretty tough to determine who worked on what, and when it comes to the PM developing the status report, I'm sure it would have been very time consuming. So, I mean, I want you to say your opinion on how that was effective or whatnot, and you know, from there I, going I, I took a lot of the time last time. How did you handle translating member hours into a status report, which is a big friction point? Yes, so actually we had two methods really that we kind of went through. Uh, the initial method was just a table on Dropbox uh, with you know, a section where they could put their, the labels of the things that they did uh, and then the amount of hours that they okay. worked on it. Uh, and that worked, um, and that part kind of stayed actually through the semester uh, to report hours on what they worked. However, uh, and this is a little bit, you know, a little bit on the side, but it will still relates to it. Um, and kind of what you were saying with quality, uh, it, a, lot with, a lot of the documentation, so the first essentially half of the project is documentation, right? So your team is working on this documentation, uh, whether it be you know all kinds of communication plans, stakeholder uh, documentation. So we, we what we ended up using is an application, actually a web application called Trello. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, you so, brought it up. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Trello, uh, it, it's really intuitive. It's very visually uh, appealing. Uh, you create cards for these uh, specific tasks. You can attach documents. And that allows you not only to control the work, but also version control of documents. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it kind of allows you to you know, go through different versions without uh, confusing the version that you're using once you put it in a master document. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing we didn't do and probably should have done uh, was to actually use that to kind of gauge our hours, what was being done. Because what we, what we did was we essentially had a backlog of all the documents that need, needed to be done, uh, and then we once a document was worked on, it would be moved on to uh, you know in progress. Once it was complete, we go to review. Once it was reviewed, it would go to in master file. So maybe tagging along the uh, login of work within Trello would have been really good. Uh, and so that's a little tip. Maybe you can try to implement uh, in, in your project. Um, but that's kind of how we did it. Okay. Kevin, wasn't there a, a something you, were, you guys were using? It, I remember you all talking about something like there was one big file that everybody could work on and it wasn't working for Yeah, you. so it actually it was called Dropbox Paper and it's essentially Word to Microsoft. Uh, it's the same thing, Paper to Dropbox. It was a new file format. It's, it's really good, uh, however the scalability of it wasn't very great. Uh, the idea was that everything was in one place in one document. Uh, however, the formatting was limited. The version control was really bad because in order to know if somebody, something changed, you would have to comment on it. Uh, and sometimes, you know, comments weren't clear or we dismiss it. Um, so version control wasn't, wasn't a good Now that you uh, mentioned version control, uh, we touched on uh, version control as regards to the app, but we never touched on version control as far as documentation, which was, I mean, for us, uh, it was already structured just because in other classes we've done it this mm -hmm. way. But I'm sure if no one's ever done it this way, I don't know how they do it, right? I'm not saying our ways is the best, but I'm sure it was a headache. For us, it was when we worked on 3343, the first time we had to print stuff, there were times where we printed the wrong document. Yeah. And we were like, it, was, it was very, very stressful. Yeah, right? I would you're like, in one folder to Google. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. And that that was, happened to us. Right. That happened to For us, us we this, uh, structured a, a Google Drive and the way we had it. I'll probably show this later on, in some snippets of pictures or whatnot, maybe in this video right now. But... Uh, the way we had it was like we had what was in the first initial project plan, the documentation that goes there, then we had the updated project plan, and then we had the finalized. Those were the two, the three main ones. Obviously, we had a lot more uh, uh, folders, but everything was organized as far as phases go. Not necessarily of like, 
what was being done, what had been done, what had not been done. Because that we originally did it for our class, and it, at first it was cool, it worked, but later on it was hard to see, like, yeah. where is the most updated one? Oh, it's in the revision, but we never passed it to the final line. Okay, and then you have to, like, scramble look for those. So yeah. for us, we, I mean, I'll let you all talk about it, but how would you personally structure that for your team? Yeah, so actually, we ended up doing that with Trello. So with oh, Trello, cool. you had your cards, uh, and, and once, you know, you had it in your backlog, so it wasn't touched, you know, you would name it version one or something. Uh, and as you started working through it, you wouldn't delete the file, you would just add on, attach a new file with the new version number. Uh, and so essentially it's a repository with all of the old files and then the new files. And you would just carry that card through the different columns, whether it be work in progress, review, QA, and then master. If there was ever a change, you would just take the latest version edit it, upload a new version, mm. and it's essentially keeping you a history uh, I don't know, of previous I didn't know Trello could do that. Yeah. That's yeah. pretty cool. It's, yeah. really, it's really cool. Uh, and you can also assign work uh, on the cards to specific people. Uh, it, it's very, very, very useful tool. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. um, that's uh, entering the, uh, uh, the G drive. Actually, now this one, uh, I'm sure. Uh, I think, I think yeah, uh, so Jeff, Jeff, I would love your opinion on something. I don't know if you've seen it yet, but I actually made a file <laughs> structure in Google Drive. Uh, Have you had a chance to? I, I did. It was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. It actually, so, almost mimicked what we had. Uh, surprisingly, yeah. So what I what I did was uh, the professor laid out uh, what all should be in the project plan, and it's broken down by uh, subject <laughs> one, this, and then there's an A, B, C subcategory. Sure. So sure. I broke it down by uh, folder. And then I put in an actual holding document for every single uh, one of his deliverables so that every single thing is broken out, people can type into it. And Google Drive, I found it actually has a fairly decent yes, it does. version control where you can go back. Yep. And I was I was unaware of that the previous semesters, which is I think why we tried to do the I way think, we did. I think it's a recent functionality on that Google makes sense. I feel like yes, we no, 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 you shouldn't, because I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. So so to be specific, let's say that we had written a, B, C, D in a document, and we found out that it should be A, B, C, D, E. Well, if you write a new document that says A, B, C, D, E, and name it the same thing, and upload it in- It's bottom version. Yeah, it will auto, Google Drive will automatically say, hey, there's already a file called 1A. Would you, it'll default to say, okay, well, here's 1A version two. And the version one will go away. It, you won't see it. And all you'll see is version two that says A, B, C, D, E. But if you are so inclined, you just go down to that little toolbox that pops up in the bottom right and say, no, no, I'd like not to merge these, but to have both of them. Mm -hmm. And then Google Drive will be like, oh, okay, so cool. So here's, here's two different versions. And actually, furthermore, within the document, you can actually see a version history change yes, in the document yes, yes. and who made them. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah accountability. So Google Drive <laughs> really has. Yeah. I hate you, you screwed up off the team. <laughs> paper, that yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, Google Drive, and I, I had exactly the same feelings as you. I was very impressed when I saw how seamlessly I could update documents. I mean, that uh, we we had our file structure that helped delineate what had been revised, what had been approved, what had been in the master print, yeah. and then of course inside that structure we also had initial project plan, uh, updated and final project plan. But as far as like the document to document updates, it was a thoughtless process. Google Drive really took care of all of that for me. Yeah. One thing I would say about to be concerned about with the Google Drive is we had a lot of formatting yeah, issues between Google yes, Drive and Word. Very true. Google yeah. Drive. What, yeah. So what do you call those PowerPoint. Google apps that you? Yeah. Yeah. The G Suite. Yeah, yeah. So th that's a good point. Uh, you should not rely on the G yeah. Suite. <laughs> so when you open up a Word document. Uh, just inside inside your Google browser, mm -hmm. your, your internet browser rather, uh, it will come up and it will look a way that you didn't want it to look. <laughs> it will have a font that you didn't choose. Treat Google Drive as a storage drive. Only. Do not make your edits inside the Google suite of applications, including Word. There's a worksheet. There's a PowerPoint. Yeah. Well, I have Google a slide. So, yeah. was it a requirement? from your client to have deliverables in Word, or would it be perfectly satisfactory to do all of your work within Google Drive, because you can do offline and have an auto-sync whenever you get back online, and you could publish whatever your deliverables were as PDFs and then hand it in? One thing I would say about that is there is a requirement for a table of contents, and Word will just do that for you. 
Oh, Google. Google. Drive us. Oh, you do have to manually create the bookmarks. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 yeah, so to push back on our position, if you uniformly mm-hmm. did Just all of your writing and formatting in a Google, in a, in a G Suite application, you would you would probably not run afoul of the issues that we did. That's true. We're just I think we just get tunnel vision into working in Microsoft Project, uh, uh, Microsoft Suite uh, uh, applications. If that's where you start, because for many people that's comfortably where they start, do not ever use your Google Suite. But if you want to uniformly use Google Suite apps, especially if you've got some kind of uh, merging behind the scenes mm-hmm. capability, you might have like a tech book. yeah. I, I don't know about anyone else. I personally, I've been moving away from Word. I've been moving away from pretty much all Microsoft product. Uh, You're a Google products. house. Yeah, it's, <laughs> okay. Well, it's uh, it seems immediately while there is that, and you know, Office cool. three sixty five that cool. is a paid service, and you get it through the university, but and I, I, and that's totally fair. And that there's good reasons to do that. I guess I would revise my uh, my uh, my critique or my opinion to say one or the mm-hmm. other. Don't write your documents in MS Word or MS Excel or any of that. Store it in Google Drive and then think you could make tiny edits just using the G Suite apps. It will, you will pull it back down to print and it will, you won't even look like anything you did. So make sure your tech stack for documentation creation is either A or it's either B. I, and I think you brought up some good reasons I wasn't even aware of for what, how, what Google Suite can do. Uh, but I would say the thing is then make sure everyone only ever, don't have one of your team members commit to this Google Suite idea of yours. And then, and then right, yeah, right. I was like, oh, well, I'm going to work on this. And then open it up in MS, MS Word, make some changes, and then try to, I wager it will be the same problem we had as putting MS Word through yeah. Google Suite. And this problem mostly comes about when when it's a documentation file that you're working on continuously. For us in particular, it was a business case, which actually leads me to my next point. Yeah. The business case is probably the hardest you're gonna get hit, first of all. The most time you'll ever spend on a document, re, you know, fixing a one up because it's the fair. most crucial as far as making your product uh, your project viable or not. Could, at least for our case when we took it, you have to save the client or you know, avoid costs at least fifty thousand dollars. In five years or five yeah, years. over five, five years. years? At first, that seemed like a lot, but afterwards we, we, we nailed it. But I will say this, it was the document that we spent the most time going back and forth and it cost us the most headaches, especially when it came to pushing it to the, to the Google Drive and then coming back and editing it. And uh, again, I'll revert to you because I don't I didn't work on your team. I want to know how you guys handle the business case. Yeah. And then I'll, I'll let Chris add his two cents on it as well. Yes, yeah, so for our business case, actually Navia handled it very well. Uh, in terms of the work actually being done in it. I will say though, with the $50,000 amount that you have to reach in a five year uh, period, it can seem a lot. However, don't be afraid to simplify. Uh, I mean, we were, for our business, we were overlooking a easy, I think it was about $28,000 uh, for the five years, and it was as simple as a website rework. Uh, and actually, Professor Detillier, uh, when we kind of showed him, showed him the business, he asked for the website, he visited, and he was like, right here's your half of your benefits. So simple things like that. I didn't know that. Yes, yes. Know that. Oh. yes. And, and the reasoning behind that, you know, is new customers, their website was really bad. Oh, uh, but yeah. I wish you could show it. That'd be awesome. <laughs> <all that we can. laughs> but yeah, so don't be afraid to simplify. But now it's not bad. <laughs> we should say. Well, yeah. Now it's now it's now it's awesome. Great. Yeah. 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 Get your phone so, repaired right there. I don't want to so, see the uh, name. Yeah. So don't be afraid to simplify your solution. Uh, don't overmiss the easy stuff. Um, and then once you get down to actually calculating your benefits, uh, I would say go conservative, conservatively. Um, You'll find that Professor Dutillier, uh he prefers the conservative, conservative, conservative numbers. Yeah. <laughs> um, you got it, man. Uh, yes. So, uh, I mean, think in the think in the customers that you'll bring in, uh, the the amount of money that they'll spend on a service or, or a membership, uh, whatever the case is for the application. Need um, greedy, like you have to get yes, as um, precise as possible. You can. Don't be too precise, though. As far as like the savings and whatnot. Yes. Well, at least know where the numbers are coming from. Well, exactly. No, he's exactly. gonna butcher that yes. for sure. He's gonna exactly. be like exactly. Because for example, for us, I don't mean to cut you off. I'll say this real quick and, and dip out. But um, for us, there was a time where we were saving the client or generating more. It was uh, two hundred. 
a four thousand yeah. dollars yeah, spent five so years. Crazy. That at a glance, if you just look at that number, at least from the professor's standpoint, that is red flag immediately. And for us, what we did that you know we planned accordingly was that we kind of did it in the storytelling way where we showed the the, uh, the professor that hey, our client is actually generating this much already or spending this much. Yeah, yeah. This two hundred four thousand is not that far off. So that's why it makes we, sense. But we and he conceded ex- that too. Yeah, right. We went into excruciating detail to walk an uninformed audience member about why what we were proposing could lead from zero to two hundred thousand dollars and at yeah the professor i believe spent most of the semester balking at that number at any, right. at, at every opportunity and when we sat down for for a post-mortem after our presentation he one of the concessions he made and if you know professor Dillier, concessions are not a common thing for him but one of the concessions he made was yeah you explained it Honestly, you got into the nitty gritty of the details. You walked me to that two hundred thousand number, and I can see exactly your thought process. Right. And and one, I mean, that was all you. I mean, you. No, really we worked on it. We worked on it. But what I wanted to say is to not necessarily to go too nitty gritty and accurate on the numbers. But yeah. what I mean is that if you do post three dollars, make sure you know where those where three dollars are coming yeah. from, yeah. like the palm of your hand. Like yeah. You have to know like like religiously where those numbers come from because. It's, a, it's part of the class, but also as part of the grade goes and the project goes, you need to back up those numbers and by formulas and knowing, like like I said, religiously, but you yeah. have to know those numbers. So the, that was kind of like in the business case. I wanted to bring that up primarily because it was our biggest headache as far as documentation goes. Um, and I'm going to close this off, right? Uh, you know, we've taken a long time on the PM side, but right now to finish it off, one of the biggest questions or I got multiple times was, it's pretty open-ended, is that, what was your biggest hurdle as a project manager? How did you do to overcome it? And what would you do differently as a project manager? So I guess there's three phases, so I'll let y'all decide, pick and choose how to go about it, but. So let's, let's talk about our, our biggest hurdles. I think we can kind of brainstorm that. So uh, for me, my biggest hurdle was getting comfortable committing the time. And, and I mentioned this earlier, but it bears repeating. It's, it's easy to watch this video and hear me say 15 hours a week minimum. And this is not, not even from a project manager. I think, I think Eric, this is the, one of the biggest hits everyone takes when they take on a developer role, an administrator role, an APM role, or a PM role. You really have to, if there's one thing you walk away from this video with, take me at my word, 10 hours to 15 hours during the fall or spring or during summer, 15 to 20 hours. That is not fluff. There's, there's, you, you have to commit those hours and there is a set amount of waking hours in a human week. And I think one of the weeks between the, like you and me, I think we had 25 or 30. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. We, I think we would routinely get into the 20s yeah. and 30s, yeah. absolutely. I think y'all got the most in our team like consistently. You need to understand that you need to make concessions in your life during this. And Professor Dutelier will tell you this, and you'll probably dismiss him first right. because you've heard professors say, one hour here equals two hours out there, and it's you've been able to pass those classes, maybe with A's, without respecting that guidance. You cannot do that here. You will fail. That's a great word. You need to understand work, personal relationships, marriages, family, friends. Things need to move to make room for this class. My biggest hurdle was coming to terms with that and getting everyone to buy into that. That this was just how your life was gonna be for two to three months. Right. What would you say your biggest hurdle was? I would say um, it's tough to choose one. Yeah. I, I, I know, <laughs> this, this <laughs> class is meant to, uh, yeah. and the way we, we, we take it, and I don't wanna speak for everyone who's gonna take this class in history, right, for the years coming, but this class is meant to push y'all, mm-hmm. push us, I mean, I was part right. of it, push us to do like, the, to the extreme. That's why you know a professor, when you play the role of client, you made it as go as possible on purpose. There's a reason there's so much, th- so many things to do. Plus the quizzes and tests on top of. It. There's a reason, right? It's for the stressful part of it. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm sure you could talk about how, what you think was like the worst and how you you managed it because there's yeah. always a bad part of this. So I would say you know one of the biggest hurdles, and I think uh, it's one of the things you kind of have to get used to, uh, and it's a good exposure. However, some might find that it isn't. Is how the professor treats you in class. Yeah. At the beginning of the class, he tells you nothing here is going to be personal, uh, but his personality 
and how he takes about in some of the, I mean, status reports. Uh, right, right. How he gets on you. He's combative. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, to be honest, for some people, I think that'll be quite a big hurdle to handle. Um, that's true, actually. That's true. But it's just something you have to kind of get used it's to. Thick skin, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and also, you, I mean, accept the criticism. Uh, obviously, he's there to make you better. Uh, you, and, and I hope that's your goal to be better. Uh, you know, I mean, that's true. Actually, it comes from the from the person. Right? Exactly. You come yeah. in with that mindset, and exactly. you want to be a better person. Exactly. And I mean, sometimes, I mean, it's quite a strong personality. Uh, but I mean, he does it for a reason. Um, with especially with industry experience, yeah. uh, I mean, you'll you'll come across people that do not, uh, you know, hold your hand. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, so him, you know, kind of pushing you, like you said, uh, might kind of seem like. You know he's not very friendly in, in some uh, circumstances, uh, but I think uh, you know developing your personal skills through the class, whether it be you know public speaking or just handling that criticism, um, I think for some people it's it's going to be tough, uh, but I think it's something that has to happen. Right. Um, and I think the best way to combat that is to not get defensive. And yeah, me personally, sure. Sure. no matter how many times I I I, I was like. To the team that kind of like hey yeah just just let it slide just you know just focus on that he's criti uh, criticizing you but at the same time he's trying to make you better right yes. but even myself <laughs> at times I fell through the rabbit hole yeah. of like I'm right I know it's right like, like <laughs> yeah. give me two yeah. seconds of my of my time I'll explain that it's right but yeah. the reality is that you should not be defensive at all yes. right I think you guys can read at least for that point about being thick skin he's trying to dog you so mm -hmm. the the worst thing you can do is combat it and if you don't have any and you wouldn't you wouldn't get that you know position to your boss right <laughs> exactly. I mean, if you do, exactly you know that's the end of your career right, that company. right, right. Uh, so take it almost like it's, it's truly your job for the either the semester or the, the summer or whatever it be uh take it with professionalism right uh, leave the personal stuff out right uh, right i would say just taking us as, as a professional uh a development course uh, make sure you know you're open to the to the constructive criticism uh but i mean just work through it. It's gonna be tough yeah. uh, in some circumstances. Just know that um, it'll help build you for your career after college. So what was the second portion? I believe this was a two-part. Uh, yeah. So uh, how did you overcome it? And you guys pretty much touched on yeah, that. Yeah. And I guess the last part to conclude this interview is basically, what would you do differently? Not just as a project manager, but as a team, as a whole. If you kind of, I don't mean to overgeneralize this, right? right. But Kind of like broad terms, because the more greedy we get, the less relatable it is yeah. for the people watching this before class. Yeah. So, so, so it's probably easy to just go as general as possible. Like, hey, high level requirements. I would have done this different. So, I'll keep, I'll keep it to the main thing I would have done. I mean, there's a number of things I would have done differently. The main thing I touched on earlier is you need to treat the professor like he owes you an hour of input. One of our biggest failings, and it starts and stops with me was that we didn't run enough design or key decisions by him early enough in our process and we paid the price later. But besides that specific instance, from the beginning, I should have been every week generating a list of a dozen to 20 questions because the sun wouldn't set on a day when one of our team members wouldn't say, I don't know what the answer is to this. What do we do with this? Some project question that we don't know, it's not in the documentation, it's not in the examples, the only source of information is the professor. From week one, I advise you to every week before class, march into his office, send him an email beforehand, a few days before, and say, Professor, I'd like to take up your 3 p.m. time slot today before our 5 p.m. lecture. And he'll, he'll say yes. I, I really, I, don't, I, I nearly guarantee, I can't speak for him, but he maintains his office hours and he will mention it if you do not show up at his office. That's so right. every week. He wants you to do that. Exactly. He's going to, yeah, he's, he's expecting it. Every week, go into his office with a list of questions that you have sourced from your team members over the past seven days. Book that time with him. Send him those questions in advance. Run key decisions and documents through him as soon as you start to feel like they're done. Give him the chance to criticize you early. The Be ERD business case, yes. those are probably the most Don't, important. Yeah, the ERDs and business That's cases, true. I think those would be the biggest two. Um, to bring up to his office, like, hey, yeah. good, no, okay, what can we Because when he criticizes those things on week two, 
easy to handle. We criticized <laughs> him on week eight, week nine, week ten. Of ten. Yeah, of, yeah, <laughs> of ten. You you're you're in trouble. So that's that's the biggest thing. He owes you an hour. Be respectful about that fact, but he owes you an hour, and it's up to you to decide how useful that hour is to your team. Because you can make or break yourself on what you get from him in terms of guidance. That's true. Sort of things I would say we would have done differently in my group, um, and in contrary to what uh, Chris's group did, we actually delayed finding our customer about a week or so, oh, maybe a week yeah. and a half. Yeah, this yeah, is yeah. a very uh, good point. So that actually put us behind specifically yeah. for the initial project plan. Uh, however, it wasn't the initial project plan isn't graded, but it's a reflection of you know how you know where you are. It sets you sets you exactly. you're still going right? exactly. Well, uh, one small caveat: It's graded. That grade is not recorded. Wait, well, yeah, it's graded. You yeah, will exactly. you will leave <laughs> with a letter grade idea of how well you're doing. Yes. But that grade will not be in your in your prod in your course grade. Exactly. exactly. And it will go down if you turn that exact same thing in. Oh, that's true. Oh, yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So with that though, I would say. Oh no, one does that. <laughs> no, yeah, it's the same. With that though, however, I would say. Put extra emphasis in finding your customer early. That's fair. Even before the class starts. I, I yeah. mentioned that in another video. Where I'm not just bullshitting. This is very critical. Like if, I'm not going to cut you off. Yeah. Yeah, I'll let you talk about it. But that's very yeah. important. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, you know, emphasize that uh, even if it means going door to door to businesses. Right, asking, right. Asking for, you know, to be able to work with you. That's only how we found our. our uh, really? Our, our, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. I was driving from work to home and I was like, we need a, a client. And on Garth Road in Baytown, I just started going business to business. Oh, wow. Until I got to it. Until I got to it. You have an extra 40 minutes to record it. I think people need those sales skills, first of all. And second, that boldness to yeah, just walk in awesome. and say, hey, we're students. We'll do this for free. Yeah, yeah. We want to help your business. Yeah. They probably just eyes open, right? Yeah, Hopefully. Because yeah, yeah. chances are, if you're watching this video, you are a CIS student who is getting ready to take this course and you're racking your brain trying to get as ready as you can before day one. Yeah. And there's only so much you can do before day one. You don't know your role, you don't know your team, all of that will be decided for you. But the thing you can do, Kevin, I think that's the biggest piece of advice that we've talked about, at least it's up there. The biggest thing you can do and control before you go into this class is have a list of two or three potential clients. Hopefully you've had a conversation with them, but at least they're an idea. Mm, right, and right. If, if everyone watching this video does that, then at least a few people in every group next semester, and semester's on and yeah, semester's on, yeah. will have that. You won't run into this debilitating issue yeah. of trying to find this client. And it sets you behind. Uh, we were about a week and a half behind you know, the, the, the other team. Uh, and to be honest, our initial project time was very weak. Uh, but with that though, uh, you know, that initial project plan, it is a reflection of where your current state is. We started fairly low, uh, much lower than I would have liked, uh, maybe more lower than you were really, uh, maybe I'm saying it. You might guess. Yeah. <laughs> you might guess. But I will tell you, we ended up with an A in the project. Yeah. Uh, so don't take that as a dismotivation. On the contrary, take that as a motivation to either work more, improve, you know, what what you're working on. Um, but one of the things that, that I do want to emphasize that we would do differently is get that client as soon as possible. Because uh, I mean, the, the sooner you do it, the more fa uh, you know, the sooner you can start getting work done. Like you know, yeah. this guy's got we're able to do. <laughs> so in my group, you know, that's that's I think that's the biggest thing we yeah. would do differently. Do it now if you're watching this video. If, <laughs> yeah, if you're watching this video and you're a few weeks out from your from the start of your capstone class, right now start thinking yeah. about who you know that might serve, might have a problem that you can solve that's the right scale and 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 intent yeah. and works within the constraints we talked about earlier yeah. in the video. And have a conversation with the professor before class. Yeah. Uh, well, that's right. Bring up the, the sample, right? Exactly. Exactly. No. Yeah. It's like it's uh, I, I made this analogy the other day. Someone asked me about this. I don't know how this came up, but I was telling them like when it comes to this project, it's like when your girlfriend or your, you know, your partner is hungry and you're trying to guess where they want to go eat. <laughs> but you text your friends instead of asking your, you know, your partner directly. So the same thing with project. Ask the professor if this is a good project and if this is good to move forward because yeah. he, at the end of the day, knows what he's going to grade and how he wants it. So at the, end, at the end of the day, don't ask us or anyone else. Just ask the professor. Yeah, he knows best of what you're looking for. Yeah. So with that being said, I'm going to end this right here. Yeah.
All right, guys, uh, if you've watched this video, you're probably staring down the barrel of your own capstone experience. Uh, we hope this has been informative. We hope we've equipped you to be successful. Uh, and the last thought we want to leave you with is that this is, this is doable. Um, don't get intimidated. You are capable of doing this. If you're at this point of the degree plan, you have all the skills you need. Utilize each other, prior proper planning, you're gonna make it. All right, guys? Yeah, yeah. you can. Yep. Go ahead and uh, just- I'm just happy to be here. Do great. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and just, you know, you got it. Uh, like he said, use your professor, your pre previous knowledge. Uh, you're almost done. <laughs> yeah. So keep that in motivation. You're, you're gonna graduate, yeah. You're, yes. you, you pass this class, you're graduating. That's something to always remember. Well, I haven't taken the course yet, but uh, you got <laughs> it, we've got it, I've got it, hopefully. Let's, uh, yeah. See you in grad school. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 Right. I hope y'all got drunk. No. I hope y'all. All right, guys. Thank you so much for watching another video. Like I said in the beginning, I'm gonna leave some show notes in the description as well as in the comments, so you don't have to watch the whole hour and a half or two hours, however long this video is. I'm gonna have it so where you can go directly to where we answer certain questions that you guys are interested in, so you don't have to watch the whole thing. If you like the whole thing, please leave a thumbs up. I would really appreciate it. And if you can subscribe, please do so. I'm actually gonna continue to post videos like this as well as like the segmented sections of this video, so you don't have to watch the whole thing, like I said. Thank you so much for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.